or patients with benign prostatic hyperplasia. A case study at the Federal Medical Center, Makodi, Benue State. For Mrs. Joy Ojile, you have the floor. Uh, and you can please make your presentation. Mm. Please. I hope I'm audible. Hello. You are very, very yes. audible, sir. We can hear you. You are you're, you're audible. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think uh, from Joy Ojile will start sharing her file. So I don't know. Hello, sorry. Can Dr. Bello help us share her slides for her, please? Good evening, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bello, please help us share the slides while she present. Thank you, sir. Come in. Okay, sir. So she can omit herself and go ahead. She is a co-host now. Uh, she, okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. I think he's on mute. Can you can you go ahead? We are hearing you. Yes. Okay. Good evening, distinguished colleagues. Uh, permit me to stand on an already existing protocol. It's a privilege for me to be doing this presentation the last presentation for the year. Um, the moderator has already introduced me. So without much ado, we'll go straight to the topic for the night, which is optimizing pharmaceutical care services for patients with benign prosthetic hyperplasia. A case study at Federal Medical Center, McCurdy, Benway State. Next slide, please. We shall be looking at this, um, topic following an outline as follows. We shall start by defining uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Then we shall look at the epidemiology of uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, which is um, BPH. After then, we shall take a look at the risk factors, then the pathophysiology, followed by symptoms, and then the diagnosis of the, of the condi ill health condition. Then the type of treatment that is recommended or that is necessary for, for someone with BPH. Then more importantly, we shall be looking at the pharmaceutical care tips, which is the focus for the day. Then we shall round up and then take a case study on this um, topic. The references will be there at the end of the presentation. So, I will all stay tuned and uh, listen attentively to the presentation, then make our input at the end of the presentation. Thank you. The next slide, let's look at the definition of um, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, BPH. Benign prosthetic hyperplasia is a common benign tumor in men. We know that it's only men that have prostate. So it's a disease or a condition in men. The women cannot have um, this uh, condition and it is responsible for urinary symptoms. Most urinary symptoms in the majority of males over the age of 50 years. So from this, we can deduce that it's a disease that comes with 
the aging prostate. It's a non-malignant enlargement of the prostate. That is the hypertrophy of the prostate gland. The prostate gland is that gland that is just beneath the bladder and it surrounds the urethra. If your urethra is the, the tube through which um, the seminal fluid and urine passes through to the outside of the male organ. So the prostate is just beneath the bladder and it surrounds that urethra. Um, and it's also positioned just be, be, um, before the rectum, rectum of the male. It's a common, prostate, um, benign prosthetic hyperplasia is a common cause of obstruction of urinary flow in elderly men. As I said earlier, men above 50 years are mostly affected with this condition. We shall now take a look at the epidemiology of BPH. Next slide, please. From autopsy studies, it has been revealed that there is a histological presence of BPH in 50% of males between the ages of 51 and 60. And this, there's an increasing uh, percentage for, of over 90% in men above 85 years of age. Well, like I said earlier, it's as a result of the aging prostate. From this, we can deduce that, that it's usually because the prostate is aging that brings about this um, benign prostatic hyperplasia. So there's an enlargement of the prostate gland as the prostate ages. In the USA, BPH cases account for about 4.5 million visits to healthcare providers annually. And that is quite high. In Nigeria too, we have more than 1.5 million cases of BPH annually that has been documented. And so we can, for that to be documented, that means there are even more cases of this BPH in uh, Nigeria as well. So it's a common um, ill health condition in men. What are the symptoms of BPH? Okay, first of all, before we look at the symptoms, I look at the risk factors, sorry. The risk factors, as I said, and I keep emphasizing that it's as a result of the aging um, prostate that brings about um, enlargement of the prostate gland. You have risk factors. The main risk factors of BPH are age and then the family history of BPH. It has been deduced that um, from uh, empirical studies that deduced that most uh, people that come, most men that come down with BPH have uh, a genetic um, a, a background of, of, of that disease. So that's why most of like it runs in the family. And then with age too, that's when it, it, it now presents itself. We have other factors like um, uh, lifestyle issues, like uh, those that are people that are obese, and then um, those that have sedentary lifestyles, they all sit in one place most of the times. And then other uh, morbid conditions like um, diabetes, mellitus, the cardiovascular disorders have also been implicated in, um, in the, uh, in the, in the, as a causative listen to, um, to um, benign prosthetic hyperplasia. But it has not been so ascertained because even men that uh, uh, that are not obese or that don't, have, that don't have such comorbid conditions can also present with um, BPH. But the main risk factors are age and um, the family history. The pathophysiology of BPH. Uh, what I said earlier where the position of the prostate is, that is just beneath the bladder. It is in, in in, in texture, it is a bit glandular, partly, and it's also a bit fibromuscular in structure. 
it's about the size of a one note. So it's so small, very tiny size. And it's, it surrounds the first part of the urethra. That is at the neck of the urethra, just at the base of the bladder. The prostate can be divided into a lobular inner zone encapsulated by an external layer. So we have the inner zone that is lobular in, in structure. Then there's an external layer too. Benign hypertrophic changes are found in the inner layer, mainly. Whereas most malignant changes originate in the peripheral or external layer. So I think that is one uh, key point that we, that we can use to uh, differentiate between the a benign prostate problem or a malignant one. Because the, inner, the benign uh, issues are usually found in the inner layer of the prostate, while the malignancy occurs on the periphery of the prostate. The prosthetic hypertrophy is directly related to the aging prostate, and that cannot be overemphasized, and to the hormone activity. It is known that within the prostate, testosterone, which is a male androgenic hormone, is converted by 5-alpha reductase into the dihydrotestosterone, DHT. That hydrotestosterone is a more potent androgenic form of uh, hormone, androgenic form of uh, um, the male hormone. That's right? the testosterone. It is a more potent form of testosterone. And that conversion usually takes place in the prostate uh, gland. The prostate gland is actually responsible for the production of the fluid that meets up with the semen and helps in transporting the semen down the urethra to the penis. So it's um, an all important organ that helps to produce that, uh, sem that seminal fluid that enhances the transport of the semen to the external uh, region for, um, for, this, for the sperm to, to swim out of the, out of this, uh, the penis and um, I mean, and, and then do what, I mean, to act um, during uh, sex or, or infertility. So it's a very, all, it's an all important organ. It's a small organ, but it's very, very important in determining male sexuality and fertility. DHT is five times more potent than testosterone and is responsible for the stimulating growth factors that influence cell division leading to prosthetic hyperplasia and enlargement. So DHT from, uh, has been postulated to be responsible for the enlargement of, of the prostate. High levels of DHT responsible for enlargement of, uh, of, of uh, the prostate gland. So as the prostate enlarges, it compresses the urethra. As I said earlier, the urethra passes through the prostate, and the urethra, urethra is, like, is a tube through which the seminal fluid, the semen, and even urine passes through to the external region. So it's, it passes through that to the prostate. So as the prostate enlarges, it compresses. There's com compression of the, of the urethra. So this compression, together with increased adrenergic tone, which, is, which has the ability to cause um, vasoconstriction can lead to the bladder outflow obstruction as the urethra narrows down. The bladder in its response will try to contract so that so as to force out more urine out of it. So in that process um, of, that, of contraction of the bladder, it can lead to obstruction of the bladder and then the manifestation of the lower urinary tract symptoms, which we shall be looking at. As the urethra becomes obstructed, the muscle inside the bladder hypertrophicizes in an attempt to assist the bladder to force out the urine. This leads to weakening of the bladder with time, of the bladder wall with time. And the bladder loses its ability to empty completely leading to increased residual urine volume and urinary retention, 
which is a complication of um, benign prosthetic hyperplasia. The lower urinary tract symptoms, they are either symptoms of failure of urine storage, which are known as irritative symptoms, or those caused by failure to empty the bladder, which can be obstructive in nature. The irritative symptoms include the frequency of urination. We also have nocturia, frequent urination at night. We have the urgency, the need to urinate, to, 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 to urinate. And then there is urge incontinence. That is the uh, there's this feeling of you of the person trying to not able to control the urine flow. The obstructive symptoms, they include the poor, poor urinary flow because of the, um, the narrowing of the urethra, the urine flow now decreases. And then the, you also experience a hesitancy in initiation of intuition. Um, because of that um, blockade, the, 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 best, the patient now feels a little bit hesitant in, in uh, urinating. In initiating the urination. And even when the person starts to urinate, there's um, intermittence in the urination. It stops and then starts again like that. Then there's a dribble. Um, at the end of, you, of the point of urinating, there's little dribble. There's, the stream is very weak. And so it just dribbles off. And then there's a sensation of incomplete emptying at the end of. Um, uh, of urinating at a particular phase, you still feel this sensation that you, are, you, are, you still want to urinate, but you can't. And then occasionally there is acute urine retention, which, which is actually a complication of benign prosthetic hyperplasia. In that case, you are not able to uh, pass out urine. The urine is retained in the bladder. Because as I said, the bladder has become weak due to the increased contraction of the bladder trying to force out the urine. So with time, the bladder becomes weak and then um, the urine, is, urine will just be retained in the bladder or it comes out without the knowledge of the, of the individual. Um, for the diagnosis of benign prosthetic hyperplasia, we have some investigations that can be carried out. Um, apart from the BPH, there are other prostate um, ill conditions that can um, occur. We have the uh, prostitis, which is an inflammation of the bladder. And then we also have uh, the malignant states, which is a uh, prosthetic uh, cancer. So we want to carry out some investigations to really um, confirm diagnosis of BPH. We have some parameters like investigations such as um, direct rectal examination, just like I said earlier, the post, uh, prostate is very close to the rectum. So the physician can insert finger through the rectum and then try to fill the prostate um, from that point. And um, it needs, of course, a specialist that will be able to get do this because the prostate is it's an internal organ. So knowing the position is very important and then you'll be able to now examine it's just the shape or the size of the prostate by putting um, a finger through the rectum. Then in that process, there's the, 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 you palpate the prostate with the finger and then uh, through the rectum wall, as I said, to estimate the size and shape of the prostate. You can also carry out some investigations like um, the urodynamic studies, um, here, the first procedure is non-invasive. Um, it provides a measure of the bladder outflow obstruction. You are going to use up some parameters like maximum flow rate and then the post void residual volume, PVR, which is the degree, the volume of uh, urine that retains after urination. Um, we also have some imaging techniques like um, flexible cytoscopy in which they are, uh, 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 like it's just like a microscope or so it's being inserted through the bladder 
to assess the degree of prosthetic obstruction. In that case, you'll be able to see the, the, the obstruction that has occurred around the, the bladder by inserting that cytoscopy through the, through the, uh, the urethra. So those are investigations that can be carried out. We also have um, another invasive uh, investigation known as transrectal ultrasonography trust, whereby you use a high frequency scanner that produces the image of the prostate just to determine, to look at the size of the prostate. Other investigations that can be carried out to confirm diagnosis of BPH are urinalysis, um, we have urine culture and sensitivity. Here you want to determine if um, the cause of uh, urinary, <clears throat> the urinary issues is as a result of an infection. Uh, so you do a urine culture and sensitivity test because with time, because of the retention of urine and other issues, um, it, um, other infections can ensue with BPH. So you want to rule that out or the infection itself can even lead to it. So we need to determine that and then so that we'll be able to treat as um, the symptom manifests. You do a urinalysis, you also do a serum creatinine uh, analysis to determine if there's any effect on the, uh, right, uh, on, the, on, the, on the kidney as well. And then the level of damage of the upper urinary tract be determined through with these parameters. We can also do uh, can also do a, a prostate biopsy. It's from the biopsy that you can determine whether the 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 the, 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 the cells are malignant or they are uh, benign. We also have the prostate specific antigen tests. Um, if we, we go ahead with this test, if you have determined from the DRE that the DRE, the direct rectal examination has revealed nodular or hard prostate, the prostate specific antigen test is also a key uh, factor in determining this, the enlargement of the prostate. And the higher the value, the, the, the more it is confirmed that the prostate is enlarged. And um, in, in, uh, in the malignant states, the PSA value is so, so high. So it's very, very high. So it will now tell you that yes, there's a problem with the prostate when you do the uh, PSA test. Um, we also have a, a, a standard uh, symptom performer that we can use to determine um, the the, the symptoms or the degree of severity of symptoms of um, BPE. It is known as the International Prostate Symptoms Core. It is a tool that has been wide world, uh, and have been adapted worldwide to provide information regarding symptoms. And this same tool can also be used to determine the response to treatment once you start a uh, treatment of uh, BPH. So you can use it to ascertain the degree of severity of symptoms. And you can also use it to determine the response to treatment because uh, it's, uh, it's a six or it's a seven pointer um, scale. You have six, seven, uh, seven questions that will be asked. And those questions border on the symptoms of of BPA that I listed earlier. So they are categorized in terms of, um, uh, as I said, severity from mild to the uh, uh, symptomatic uh, observation to the severe one. So you want to know it so that you now, it will also aid you in the kind of treatments that you will find, you will opt for or that you will choose. So you do that IPSS, um, use the tool to do that, to determine the severity of symptoms. And the last pointer, which is the eighth question, is known as the border score. And that border score is used to 
uh, determine the quality of life of the individual. And all those parameters help you to know the type of treatment to use because even if you have symptoms manifesting and uh, you know, depending on how they are, if it is mild, yeah, moderate or severe, and um, it's, uh, it still boils down to the individual. If you feel that those symptoms are not really bothersome, you can cope, then you will know the kind of how to opt for what any kind any particular type of treatment. We'll come to that when we come to look at the treatment of BPH. I hope we are following. Yes, I hope you are following. Yes, yes, yes. We are with you. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, in the International Prostate Symptoms Call, as I said earlier, they border on the various symptoms that ensue in um, BPH. We have um, the first question bordering on in, incomplete emptying. And all the parameters, all those questions are, uh, we look at the, the, um, the degree over in the past one month. The first question, let's look at what well, the first one, talk about uh, incomplete emptying. The question will be asked that over the past one month, how often have you had the sensation of not emptying your bladder after you have finished urinating? Is it, do you, do you don't, do you, I mean, do you uh, observe this at all? If you don't, to be zero. We have a scale of zero to five. And that scale uh, trails down to the severity. Then if it is less than one in five times in the month that you have the uh, need, to, you, 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 don't come, you don't, I mean, you don't empty completely, then it's going to be one score. Then if like less than half times of the month, you are having this um, symptom, then it's going to be two. Then if about half of the month, that is like 15 days in the month, then it will score, your score will be three. If it's more than half the time, then it will be four. Then if it's almost always throughout the month, then it will be five. So the next question boils down to the frequency over the past one month, as I said. The same way, that format from mild to severe. The third is on, um, next slide, please. The third is on intermittency. That is when you start over the past one month. If you, if the the the, the, the patient, if you start uh, urinating, how how in between do you stop and then start again? Do you stop intermittently? How how is it? How often does it occur in the uh, within the thirty days of the month? You have that range again from one to from zero to five. Zero is not at all. That is, you're not experiencing that symptom. And then five is that you are always experiencing it within that month period. Then we have the fourth um, parameter, which is urgency. That's um, like you always have the urge to, you have the urge to unite, you know, from zero to five as the case may be. Then the fifth one is on, um, next slide, please on the, the stream of the urine over the past one month. The, when, when the urethra is not um, narrowed, the urine stream is supposed to be high. It's supposed to pass out urine in uh, uh, a concave, or, I mean, normal stream is to flow. It's supposed to flow freely. But when, they, when it's weak, when your the flow is just weak like that, it's, uh, it's an issue. So you observe it over the past one month, how is it, how is the weakness of the stream of urine? Then the sixth parameter is on um, straining over the past one month. That is when you want to urinate, do you urinate with difficulty? Do you have to strain to pass out urine and that range from zero to five. So that is, those, uh, doc, those parameters is, of, is emphasizing on the severity of the symptoms from mild to severe form. The mild is usually considered if you have a total score of less than eight, less than eight. As I said, the questions are seven. So, and the pointers are from zero to five. So if you add up and you have less than eight of those um, symptoms, less than eight points, because the total point is going to be like 35, 
uh, am I right? 35, okay, 42, because from zero to five, we have six, six, six times seven is 42. So if you have less than eight points, then it's a mild, you're experiencing mild symptoms. If you have them um, between eight, between eight and 20, they are more, it's moderate. Then above 20 is classified as being severe symptoms. Then the eighth question, as I said, it talks about, it borders on the quality of life of the individual. The question here is how will you feel if you were to spend the rest of your life with your urinating condition? Just the way it is now, how will you feel? Are you comfortable? Are you okay? Are you satisfied most times? You have mixed feelings about it. You are not too okay. Are you mostly dissatisfied? Are you unhappy before at all? Is it so terrible? So those, that eight point is pointing on the quality of life of the individual. And I think that is a key factor in determining a form of treatment we shall, um, we shall engage such a patient. And normally the treatment is usually discussed between the patient and the health provider. So the decisions are taken um, together so that the patient will be carried along. So those are the uh, diagnosis, ways of diagnosing them, BPH, and which also uh, takes us to the treatment of BPH. On diagnosing, on diagnosing the, the condition, we want to do something about it, especially if it bothers on the quality of life of the individual. The treatment, the therapeutic options that we have, usually they all have their benefits, they have their risk, and they have their consequences. But first, we'll be looking at the echo outcomes of treatment, like the economic, clinical, humanistic outcomes of the treatment, which is our main focus as a health provider and as pharmacists. Um, especially. We want to make sure that the patient is okay with the treatment as much as possible. It's going to alleviate, uh, the treatment is going to alleviate symptoms. It's going to make the patient have a better quality of life. It's going to make the patient still live a normal life. And as I said, you have to discuss with the patient because as I said earlier, all the forms of treatment have their risk, they have their benefits and they have their consequences. Because not treating at all too can be a problem, still depending on the severity of symptoms of their BPH. So we have different treatment options. We have the first, which is um, what we call watchful waiting. <laughs> Just like in most chronic illnesses, um, because of the the benefits and risk um, effects of uh, treatment, there's a time we will need to just not use any pharmacological measures in treating BPH. Because uh, with, with men with that have, men that have um, mild um, symptoms of BPH, we can we can offer this option of treatment, which is watchful waiting, where we are not going to use any pharmacological measures because the symptoms are mild and the, the patient has already, is already is, is telling you too that he can cope. It's not too bad. It's not bad. So you will not want to go into some of this um, pharmacological or other treatment because they come with uh, some negative uh, outcomes that we will not want to taste legal into. So if the symptoms are mild, they can resolve with time. And basically what we do in watchful waiting is um, lifestyle modifications, just like what we do in most chronic uh, ill health conditions. We just, you and the client or patient will discuss it, that since the symptoms are mild, they are not so bothersome, so well, let's see, let's try and do some lifestyle modifications and then not go on medications or the other form of intervention, which is surgical, but we just watch and see how it goes. And then we monitor 
uh, regularly. So that is what watchful mating is all about. You, you, you we, we do, after the diagnosis, we do, um, we do we counseling on lifestyle modif modifications and then the patient is asked to uh, make some frequent or regular visits and monitoring. We do some baseline PCA, we determine uh, the, the size, the base uh, at, at, at the initial time, determine the size of the prostate and watch. You can, the visits can even be like um, year annually or depending on how the uh, symptoms will start progressing can become uh, twice or twice in a year. But for some men, it actually resolves with time. Those, what are these lifestyle modifications? We have, like I said, during the, the uh, when we're talking about the risk factors, we have uh, uh, cutting, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, the main lifestyle modifications are, they boil down to our the diet. Then we have uh, exercise. We have, uh, um, uh, 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 I mean, cutting down on some uh, on alcohol and alcohol because we know the effect of alcohol on the bladder. It also has it has irritating effects on the bladder. So if the patient can cut down or even either limit or abstain or avoid alcohol totally, to be of immense um, benefits in um, or once the patient is has been diagnosed with BPH. So we advise the patient to cut down or stop intake of alcohol to exercise because as the process plan as it has enlarged, you know, there are some pelvic exercises that can help. Like um, you can even tell the patient to do some seize bath, you sit in the warm water for a while, and then it will help to, to, to aid in the shrinking of the prostate gland. We also have a uh, uh, weight reduction, weight reduction because uh, it, the obesity, uh, they said uh, uh, increased um, abdominal fat can also um, cause some kind of irritation or uh, distension on the bladder wall. So you can tell the, the individual if the person is on the weighty side to shed some weight and then engage in exercise, moderate exercise and then uh, when, the, when the patient is going out to public places or at night, it can reduce the fluid intake, especially the use of um, caffeinated drinks because caffeine has the ability to retake the bladder. And so we can we advise the patient to avoid caffeinated, uh, caffeinated drinks and um, uh, beverages and as well as, well as carbonated uh, drinks too, like all these energy drinks, should avoid them as much as possible because they have the irritative effect on the bladder. And um, with this, you can just keep monitoring the patient and see if the symptoms will resolve. So the next uh, treatment option we have are the therapeutic um, uh, management, which is the use of drugs. The principal drug also in the management of BPH are uh, the alpha adenoceptor blockers and the five alpha reductase inhibitors or a combination of both. Let's look at the alpha adenoceptor blockers. How is that? How are they, uh, are they, are they implicated in the treatment of uh, BPH? Next slide, please. No, okay. The alpha adenoceptor blockers. Next slide, please. I think we have done. We are done with this slide. The alpha adenoceptor blockers are implicated in the treatment of BPH because the urethra and the prostate they have very smooth muscles. They have. Uh, that, that, that uh, have adrenergic receptors there, where the alpha, uh, where, where, where um, adrenaline through the alpha receptors mediate an effect of, uh, uh, of, of vessel constriction. They have to constrict the vessels. And in, as we said earlier in VPH, there is also, there's already narrowing of, or constriction of, the urethra. 
So we want to use um, the alpha renocetal blockers to bring about relaxation of the smooth muscles in the urethra and in the prostate and the bladder as well. So the, it is known that the prostate gland is very responsive, responsive to adrenergic stimulation. Alpha receptors predominate and mediate the contraction of prostate gland smooth muscles. The increase in sympathetic tone is potentially reversible by alpha adrenergic blockers. We have um, examples of um, prazosine, doxazosine, tamsulosine, and aflozosine. But the commonly used adrenergic blockers are the uh, doxazosine and tamsulosine. Then the next form of uh, pharmacological, pharmacological intervention is the, uh, they are the five alpha reductase inhibitors. We said earlier that the potent form of testosterone, which is dihydrotestosterone, is, is, um, is mainly uh, present in the, in the prostate and it is responsible for the enlargement of the prostate gland. So if we can have um, agents that can inhibit the conversion of testosterone to DHT, it will go a long way in shrinking or re preventing the more enlargement of the, of the prostate. So we have the five alpha, five alpha, five alpha reductase inhibitors to do that. We prevent the conversion of, of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone by inhibiting that enzyme that, that causes the conversion. The primary adrenergic, sorry, the primary and androgen for the development and progression of BPH is DHT, as I said. Five alpha reductase inhibitors prevent testosterone conversion to DHT, thus down regulating the prostate enlargement. These agents therefore improve flow rates and the lower urinary tract symptoms, thus reducing the incidence of complication such as acute urinary retention. So because the, when once the process, the prostate gland shrinks, it now gives way for the, for the passage of urine via the urethra with ease. So uh, the, the bladder would not have to contract or constrict so much uh, before it would become weak, um, before it gets weak. So the acute urinary retention that ensues at the end of that as a result of, uh, of the weakened prostate, of the weakened bladder, we no longer occur. So five alpha reductase inhibitors help to prevent that complication of acute urinary retention and also enhance urinary flow. We have examples of, of the five alpha reductase inhibitors as uh, finasteride and dutasteride. Uh, there's a third class of uh, pharmacological agent that can be used, although these are seldom used, except in cases of, um, of uh, some side effects of the drug. We can now opt for this as a, a drug of choice, but they are not used most often. They are called the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, PDEs inhibitors. They are the renowned... Um, drugs that, we, that are used for sexual dysfunction. They have been known to improve prostate symptoms by increasing the flow rate because they help to relax the muscles of the urethra. We have the sildenafil, we have badenafil, tadalafil, and abanafil. But in clinical, uh, situations, the, the one commonly used is Tadalafil, that is this uh, Cialis, is a drug of choice. So this can be a benefit when we come look at the side effects of the analysis of, uh, of the pharmacological agents, especially the 5 alpha reductase inhibitors. They have, since they shrink, the, they, they have the ability to shrink the post-trait, they are going to reduce post-trait function and as I said earlier, the prostate is responsible for production of the seminal uh, fluid that helps to um, uh, transport semen, uh, sperm 
down the uh, urethra. So if it shrinks, then uh, it's going to reduce the, 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 the ability to produce the darts and seminal fluid. And as, as a result, um, the motility of the sperm too will be reduced and that, that can lead to some sexual dysfunction. And um, depending on how the patient can tolerate uh, or the patient's uh, reaction to it, we can decide to now opt for that third class, which we just mentioned, the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, if that, um, if that effect is becoming bothersome. The third, a fourth form of treatment are, um, we call it the phylotherapy. That is the use of um, plant-based extracts. It has been implicated too that um, the number of plant extracts are effective in management of BPH. We have them in form of supplements like in the salt palmetto from uh, clinical use. Uh, it's been deduced that um, it can help to uh, it can help to inhibit the. Uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, to inhibit uh, anti-inflammatory, it has anti-inflammatory effects that can inhibit the um, prostanoid formation or enlargement of the prostate. So when, especially at the early stage or the, uh, when the symptoms are very mild, this um, phytotherapy can come in very handy and um, they can help to alleviate symptoms of BPH. We have other plant extracts like the African plum tree we have singling nettle. Uh, we have other uh, phytotherapy uh, extracts that can be used. Um, most, as we said, they are all plant-based. Uh, some people have even postulated the use of onions, tomatoes, and the likes that because they contain antioxidants. And so, because in the process of, um, in the, <clears throat> in the, um, in the pathophysiology of um, BPH, there are also some anti there are also inflammatory responses that bring about the contraction or enlargement of the prostate. So, when we have we have antioxidants in these plants that can bring about um, anti-inflammatory responses, they will help to alleviate um, the condition. <coughs> Next slide. The last form of treatment for BPH is the, they are the surgical uh, treatments. From the watchful waiting through to the use of medications and then lastly, surgical treatment. Um, the surgical treatment, usually they have um, more, they, they are more, I mean, they are a better form of treatment, but they have more risk and more uh, consequences from the treatment and of the treatments. So as much as possible, we want to make this like an, a last option or in cases of severity of symptoms, that is when you, you now offer the surgical treatment. Uh, in those days, the surgical treatments were usually very risky. They come with uh, complications and all that, but nowadays we have very, um, very good techniques that have been in, that have been implicated in in, in, in this treatment, and the prognosis has been coming out very fantastic. So the fear of surgery shouldn't really be a problem any longer because the prognosis is quite good. Surgical interventions are performed when response to medications fails, and in patients who develop complications such as retractable or recurrent urinary retention, renal impairment, persistent hematuria, or bladder stone. In our procedures such as the transuretral resection of the prostate, which is the removal of sections of the prostate using electrical wire loops attached to a telescope inserted through the urethra. This is an invasive technique that is being used to remove um, a session of the prostate. And um, in that, so the session of the prostate, right, is the area that is enlarged, is removed, and then the, the, the symptoms now resolve.
but um we, they also have their they have their consequences as i said earlier um of course if they posted land most part of it is off then it's going to lead to uh, impotence or inability to 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 and they lead to impotence or erectile dysfunction the, we also have another technique such as the transurethra incision of the prostate. Here we use um, the, the lightest scoop that is being used to insert it through the urethra. Then some incisions are made on the prostate, like it's being blasted, and then um, the enlargement goes. I mean, um, is the, the incision is made on the prostate gland, and then like goes to uh, returns to uh, its normal size. Then we also have the open prostatectomy. Here it involves the surgical removal of an enlarged prostate. This is quite an invasive um, procedure. It's restricted to men with very enlarged prostate gland and then um, those with large bladder stones or bladder diverticulars. Aside the, the, the invasive and surgical treatments, we also have some minimal invasive techniques that are more currently used and they come with lesser uh, advanced or side effects. We have the thermotherapy. Yeah, the technique is used, the, the technique used is um, uh, an electro vaporization where so water vapor with electrical impulses are being uh, inserted and then the the the, the transurethral microwave heat treatment That's which is the prostate to cause vaporization of the tissue okay. so the tissue now vaporizes okay. and goes up and Hello, then... now we can make it snap here and go to the okay so next slide please next slide i think that's all about the treatment um same thing talk about another form which is the um transurethral okay we've talked about this next slide next slide So we now look at the pharmaceutical care tips that we should really focus on while interacting with patients with um, BPH. We should advise that the patient should seek medical help because of impact of symptoms on their quality of life. Patients on alpha adrenoceptor blockers should be advised that it may take three to six weeks before symptomatic relief is seen. We should also reassure patients on, on this agent who complain of cardiovascular adverse effects such as dizziness, syncope, palpitation, tachycardia, or angina that is common after the first dose as the side effect of alpha adrenoceptor blockers. But subsequently, these side effects resolve. So the patient shouldn't see it as a, uh, a problem or a uh, uh, um, or, or as a reason to stop taking the medication. We should counsel patients that there might be decreased libido or impotence with the 5 alpha reductase inhibitors. There, should, there can also be um, observation of a, a kind of ejaculation called retrograde ejaculation with alpha adrenoceptor blockers and even with the even with the 5 alpha reductase inhibitors too. It will be the ejaculation is a term where the, uh, instead of uh, ejaculating externally, the, the terminal fluid goes back into the bladder and um, ejaculation, is, ejaculation goes in the, 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 into the bladder instead of coming out through the penis. Um, there's a uh, unilateral or bilateral gynecomastia. Um, first, as breast enlargement is a frequently reported side effect with the 5 alpha reductase inhibitors. So, the patient should know that uh, the side effect of the drug. But as I said, these effects they wear off with time. After a prolonged use of the medication, the effect can wear off. So, the patient shouldn't, shouldn't see it that as a reason to stop taking the medication. The patient's on finasteride or the and has a sexual partner 
who is pregnant should be counseled on use of condom because exposure of semen of patients on either of these drugs can cause abnormalities to the genitalia of the male fetus. This is, all, this is expected because they have the ability to reduce the size of the prostate. So it's going to like reduce uh, the production of the potent adrenergic hormone of the, of the male fetus. And as such, there might be a reduced size of the male genitalia and the prostate. So patients that uh, have uh, that um, their uh, spouse are pregnant and now on this medication should use a condom to avoid that congenital abnormality. In conclusion, BPH is a common condition in elderly men which increases in prevalence with age. A combination of increased adrenergic tone or prosthetic stomach and bladder neck, as well as anatomical, anatomical effects of an enlarging prostate leads to lower urinary tract symptoms and bladder outflow obstruction. Surgical interventions such as transurethral resection of the prostate are effective but less invasive procedures such as laser therapy and chemotherapy are used with minimal consequences. After adrenoceptor blocking drugs are effective in reducing symptoms, they are basically the first drug of choice. Five alpha reductase inhibitors reduce prostate size, they relieve symptoms and increase urinary flow rate, as, as well reduce the risk of developing complications such as acute urinary retention, or the need for prostate surgery. Thank you very much. So we have come to the end of the presentation. I don't know if we should take some questions before we go into the case study, or we should go ahead with the case study. Uh, you should go ahead with the case study. This okay. is the mainstay of the work, uh, okay. but it's very brisk, uh, maybe, Next, we'll have less than 30 minutes left. So okay. just make it snappy, maybe five minutes. This okay, is sir. Then we'll work, the case study, yes. Mm. Okay, thank you. So the case study is here. MT is a 65-year-old male farmer, weighing 57 kg, who presented at the A and E with complaints of difficulty in maturation of two months origin. There's a cough and difficulty in breathing of two weeks duration. He was apparently well until about two months ago when he developed difficulty in maturating with associated pain on urination. There is also history of urinary frequency, urgency and nocturia. Associated history of straining, pulse stream, feeling of, feeling of incomplete voiding, and terminal dribbling. Neal hematuria. The patient smokes and ingests alcohol. No known drug allergy. On examination, the patient was a febrile, not pale, and etheric not dehydrated, nil pedal edema. The CBS shows that the blood pressure is 130 over 90, pulse rate 93 beats per minute, heart sound S1 and S2, respiratory rate 24 seconds per minute. The chest is clinically clear. The abdomen moves with respiration. There is no liver or kidney or spleen uh, enlargement. On direct uh, rectal examination, it was observed that it enlarged and prostrate, nodular, firm, with benign features. The patient is a known hypertensive and also has a, had heart failure and is on frustinide, losartan, Vasopin, Cavedilol, and Digoxin. 
patient is not a diabetic and there is no history of blood transfusion. The assessment is bladder outflow obstruction secondary to BPH and we should rule out cancer of the patient. A plan, counseling, counseling points to do abdominal pelvic USS scan to determine if there's a determine, um, any problem with the bladder, kidney, or prostate. We do the prostate uh, specific antigen test, urinalysis, urine, MCS, and um, urine electrolyte creatinine. We do full blood count and differentials. And the patient is uh, placed on tab tamsulosin, 400 microgram daily for one month. The patient was then asked to see um, uh, a doctor in the urology clinic in three weeks with the test results. After three weeks, the patient presented with um, the result of PCA of 11.8 nanogram per meal. The abdominal uh, scan showed enlarged prostrate with benign features. From the urine MCS, there was no bacterial growth. Full blood count had my thrombocytopenia. So at that point, patient was counseled again or booked for post biopsy. We continue taking the tansulosin uh, after the energy blocker. Then see with the biopsy result in three weeks. Then uh, with that follow-up after three weeks, the biopsy histology results revealed nodular hyperplexia with no features of malignancy seen. Patient complained of dysuria, no hematuria, no urethral discharge, and a blood pressure 130-90. The plan was then to place the patient on combination therapy of tab pinstam one daily for eight weeks, and then tab lexotan three milligram noxy for three days, for five days, sorry. So from this case study, we can make our contributions and then look at the pharmaceutical care points that this patient will require or if what we did is all right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, from, um, Mrs. Joy Ojile. Thank you, Benoit State for Thank this you. excellence and uh, amazing presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, we'll, maybe we'll use two minutes to look at the work. Um, mm -hmm. Our time is far spent. We have less than 20 minutes. But I would like to use this opportunity to, to recognize some of the members of uh, School of First Past, uh, like the Professor Bula Joko, I know. Uh, Professor Ishmael Juleiman, our national chairman, Dr. Joseph Madu, then our technical crew chief, Dr. Bello, is always there for us, and uh, former presidential aspirant, my friend, Dr. Dulu Ojo. Uh, we recognize you, all of you. We recognize uh, everybody on the platform. Uh, you're all welcome. Please let us use uh, two minutes to look at the work before we go into Q and A session. Uh, you, uh, after we don't have time, we have less than um, twenty minutes uh, for this type of presentation. It's only one and a half hours that's allowed. So uh, I've seen some hands raised up, and um, at the appropriate time, maybe two minutes, uh, we'll start um, asking them to fire their question when necessary. Thank you. Thank I you, think sir. I'm audible. Mm. Yes, sir. Hello. Okay. 
let's use two minutes. Two minutes. We'll make it snappy. But we'll have uh, less than uh, 20 minutes. Hello. Hello. Uh, I think the national chairman is around. Um, maybe the year has almost ended. Maybe he has to make few remarks before we go into the Q&A session. I think the national chairman is around. Um, yes, yes, he is. Yes, OK. Uh, Dr. Mahadu, please. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Please, am I audible enough? Yes, sir. Sorry, I have some cold for some few days now, but I'm getting back to my normal strength. I want to use this opportunity to thank Benue Sipan and most importantly, the presenter, uh, pharmacist Joy Ojile. Uh, no doubt, every one of us this night has learned a lot and something. And I want to thank all the participants this night because without participants, there will not be presentation. I also thank our leaders, our senior colleagues, Professor Olajo, uh, Dr. Lolojo, and the rest of them. I thank you so much. I thank everyone. I want to wish you happy Christmas and okay, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year in advance. I know we may this is our last clinical meeting for the year. We have done so well this year. Sipan has uh, conquered a lot of uh, this. We have gotten a lot of breakthroughs this year, and we believe. We are believing God that it can only be better next year. We shall do much better. And as I usually say, what we are doing, no doubt is going to better our profession. We are already seeing the gains of all these things. So once again, thank you so much, the moderator, all those who are making pharmacy profession better. Whether you are learning or you are presenting, we, you discover that we are all learning something. And they said that... Um, uh, leaders are leaders, of course, yes. we are leaders, even if we are just having it as a presentation. So we are going to Sorry. be leaders. All our dreams for the healthcare team, we believe it will come true, and we are making it come to pass. I pray that the good Lord will reward all of us and bless all of us most abundantly. Amen. Thank you once more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our national chairman, uh, we are entering Q and A session. I've seen uh, Dr. Solomon Wafu hand raised. So, uh, Dr. Solomon, mute yourself and um, make your contribution. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? We are yes, hearing sir. you. Uh, distinguished colleagues, good evening, everybody. Good evening, the moderator, the presenter, uh, our VIPs in the house. This is indeed um, a stimulating indeed, presentation. Uh, a stimulating presentation. I, I don't know whether I, I can, am I audible enough? Yes, you are. Uh, ben West, you did very well. I am just like my own, is just a little contribution. Okay. And then... Uh, Maybe a little an X-ray before I go to the other one. You will be very short and fast. One is that um, 
the international classification you used from 2000. Yeah, there is another one currently, <coughs> Wally, which they use, call it AUA, American Urological Association Scoring Scale. Yes. In that particular one, you now do zero to seven nanogram per male as a mite, which is watchful waiting from eight to 19 will be intermediate. That is actually where the drug comes in. Then the yes. last phase above 19 is where the surgery will take place. Yes. And, and that's all is a good one to I now run into the, into the, the, the pharmacotherapy where I noticed something that this patient is underweight, 57 kg. Mm. That means gradually many things might be there the parameters that need to be assessed, to be the food book count, the, the fasting count. lipid profile, uh, and uh, some other parameters to know what is really wrong with this patient. Why is he going down in weight? Because he's actually weighing like a, a Chinese person. And secondly is um, when he made mention of drugs, alpha blockers that, that being used, which principally is alpha one because yes. you don't use alpha-2 to treat this. Um, mm -hmm. Among all those alpha blockers, there are ones called urologically selective. It's only two ones in the world. And those ones that are called urologically selective are the ones that are most importantly used because they have reduced side effect and they don't have effect in the cardiovascular system. Yeah. Because they ha doesn't have effect much in the vascular, little or none in the cardiovascular system, they are being used in US and other developed worlds. Those ones are tamsulosine and silodosine. But those are fuzosine, which is the one that is physiologically select uroselective, and the doxazosine, those ones has effect, so much effect in the cardiovascular system, and it seems to attack isoenzyme alpha one, A, B, C, and D. Why this tamsilosine principally attacks that of B and makes it a choice drug to be used by urologists in the world. And most of all these drugs, based on all this counseling when we are following up, are majorly used at night. I don't know the choice of the urologist of not bringing in 5-alpha reductase inhibitor when the case was established that the PSA is 11 point something. Because in that particular parameter, we actually know that there is no way the case can be malignant because it has not gone so much due to the dostrusumoso has not actually convoluted so much to push into that way. And uh, I expected him to add Five alpha reductase inhibitor. And the one that would have been better used is dotesteride. Dotesteride and finasteride does not have the same pharmacological potency. The reason is that dotesteride binds on isoenzyme one and isoenzyme two. Why finasteride binds only on isoenzyme one? And dotesteride effect can be seen within one month of use. Why finasteride is the one that can be seen over six months when the min maximal pharmacological constituency will be reflected on the patient that is using it. And this patient, as you presented, has a pulmonary hypertension. He has problem with difficulty in breathing and thereabouts. And you made mention of um, the use of uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors. I don't know why the physician did not use it. Even though cavedilol, which is a mixed action drug that binds in alpha-1 and non-selective beta-1 and beta-2, equally has implicative pharmacological benefits on the pulmonary system of the patient. But I suspect that that tadanafil would have to be brought in because this patient is having problem with breathlessness. And if you check it, because of that breathlessness, the pulse rate of this patient has actually increased. There is tachycardia already which I know the covered law will take care of. But a drug of choice would have been bringing in the sildenafil or bringing in the tadanafil. So I have to tell you, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. But I believe that those areas are the areas that are supposed to have been monitored and equally patient advice on how to use this drug like tamsulosine and the testosterone in the night because it has major effect of drowsiness, dizziness, disturbances, and all other things. And you've actually made mention of the issue of what the drug is going to cause, like low libido and all those things, which I believe uh, if the drug which you mentioned in your array of pharmacological presentation was done by using the, the phosphodiesterase inhibitor, the issue of that breathlessness mm -hmm. and all those things wouldn't have actually arisen. And it would have been another 
additional drug that should be added. And secondly, uh, finally, uh, checking the issue of why the patient is underweight at the, age, at the weight of 57 kg, which is normally the weight of Chinese people, not the weight of people in the black hair. Thank you, and God bless you for this wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you, my education chairman, Dr. Mafuro. Um, we have less than uh, eight minutes left. Um, maybe you will continue and give us a closing remark. While, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> While, <laughs> Dr. Iji. <laughs> Prime Minister, I will give up a closing prayer. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, give us a closing remark. Ibrahim Abbas, I think he's there. Uh -huh. uh, give us a, a, a closing prayer. Um, my education chairman, you can continue. Give us a, a closing okay, remark. Should, okay, thank yeah. you so much. It has been a wonderful one. Wonderful one. We thank our mm. national chairman, Dr. Joseph Madu. We thank the erudite colleagues that are in the house, Dr. Lulujo, and all of that professors in our mix. And you that has been moderating has been a wonderful one. And the presenter, she did justice to this topic. And all the household of this association that is making us proud internationally is a wonderful one. Just like the chairman said, we have actually done well this year. And I believe that Almighty God will keep us very sound and safe and give us more weight of knowledge to mm -hmm. take this profession more to where we're supposed to reach which actually we are getting to. And this shall be well with us, as I conclusively wishing everybody a very thunderous Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you. It is, has you, been sir. a wonderful night. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Ibrahim Abbas, uh, please give us a closing prayer. Uh, is, is there now? Uh, hello? Is it not there? Unmute yourself, please, if you don't mind. Mm. See none there. Okay, if, if I'm about, I'm not if I uh, rabbi, do do that for us. Or anybody in the house so that we'll close. Latifat, you can commute yourself, please give us a closing prayer. We give that to Allah Almighty yeah, okay. for bringing us successfully to the end of this very wonderful impactful and educative program. Yep. We thank him for his guidance and for his blessing. We pray that he continue to bless us and Sipan in general. Amen. Amen. End of prayer. Amen. Compliments of the season. Thank you. Thank you. Compliments of the season, everyone in the house. Good night. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you so 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 much. Th